welcome to space. Now these days the space sector is all around us in navigation and telecommunications and the science happens in high-tech facilities like this. But the last 50 years of space in Europe have been a roller coaster ride and we're going to tell that story. But first, some more news from the universe this month. NASA has given the go-ahead to build a spacecraft to collect samples from an asteroid. The OSIRIS-REx mission should have the space rock back on Earth by 2023. This is the first of many photos to come from Canadian company Earthcast. It recently installed an HD camera on the ISS and aims to offer near live images of Earth from space. To our main story now, and Europe's first steps in space came in the early 1960s in the heat of the Cold War. 50 years ago, the world had just begun to race towards space. Sputnik had sent its first signal, Yuri Gagarin had flown into orbit, and there was constant sparring between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, the world was an extremely dangerous, fragile place. Superpower rivalry was probably at its height in the early 1960s, particularly around the Cuban Missile Crisis when I was a young man and I certainly thought that was the end of the world. And I think many people did. Into that climate of tension stepped Italian Eduardo Amaldi and Frenchman Pierre Auger, two European physicists. They fervently believed that rockets and satellites should be used for science, not sabre-rattling. The countries that made Europe's space sector were the countries that 20 years beforehand were at war. A terrible war. Those countries in Europe who'd been at war got together and decided to use a language that couldn't drive them to conflict. The language of science. ESRO, the European Space Research Organization. With Amaldi and Auger's lead, Europe took two giant steps by founding two space organizations, one for rockets called ELDO and one for science called ESRO. The early years were ones of limited budgets, problems with the Europa rocket, and tensions between partners like the UK and France. Then in the late 60s, they began to say, OK, we should really begin to fuse these two organisations. This went in fits and starts, though. And a programme was, 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 was hammered out in a very, very tense meeting in 73, which would be the basis of this new single organisation. It would have space science as a mandatory programme. Mandatory not because people loved science, but precisely because they didn't want to fund it. That obligation to fund science within the new European Space Agency was later seen as a masterstroke as it boosted the research sector. But Europe still needed its own space rocket. The Germans were against the development of Ariane. The Brits were hostile, extremely hostile to the development of Ariane. It took the French to say, we're going to do this. And it's frankly thanks to French gaullism and a suspicion of the United States' motives that the French embarked on that. And that is undoubtedly the greatest success of European space effort. Ariane 1 first launched in 1979. And while it may have been designed with a burgeoning telecom sector in mind, it also flew science missions into orbit. One of the early standouts was the Giotto probe's flight past Halley's Comet in 1986. I have been in the space business for more than 40 years, starting at university, but my strongest memory I can tell you is still the night of the heli encounter with Giotto. Adrenaline was high, but for the whole night, because it had to work and it worked great, and then all of a sudden, just at the closest approach, you know, the spacecraft was hit and tumbled, and then, you know, we lost the, the link to the spacecraft. It came back after 20 minutes. It was, you know, it was just overwhelming the way you couldn't do a lot, but it was just to see how it worked and, and to feel with your colleagues and to feel with all the people there at, uh, at ESOC that this was really a great, a great event. A decade later, in 1996, came a low point in Europe's space odyssey. The new Ariane 5 roared off on its first ever flight, carrying the precious cluster science satellites. 40 seconds later, it blew up in mid-air.
Et je n'oublierai jamais dans ma vie <laughs> de voir ces I'll never forget seeing these kinds of giants who were the project managers. Énormes, costauds, vraiment, Big guys, chefs, real bosses, qui, uh, who were crying in a little uh, hangar uh, behind the rocket control center. Centre de contrôle de, de la fusée. Je me suis and I swore that we'd relaunch the cluster uh, mission, cluster. and that's what we did. Cluster is still active, and in 2005, ESA, working with NASA, landed a probe called Huygens on the surface of Saturn's moon Titan. It was a new milestone in science. The Huygens landing on Titan was an extraordinary achievement. Was also, uh, I would say, it was also nerve-wracking to get it there. It's the furthest ever landing by a man-made object in history. Back on Earth, the prestige of science is tempered by the art of politics, practiced by ESA's 20 member states at meetings like this. Space funding is hard fought. One key element of negotiations is the principle of fair return, the idea that what a country invests, it gets back in contracts. It builds expertise, but it also has its problems. It is obliged the big countries, France and Germany, who could do something more perhaps more quickly, perhaps more efficiently, perhaps even cheap, more cheaply, to build major consortia in which, you know, if a country participates 5% in a program, they've got to get 5% of the high-tech contracts. That's complicated to manage. Complicated to manage, but able to yield great results. Today we still have uh, Mars Express working, we still have Venus Express working. Rosetta is very close to the comet. The Europe of science is the Europe that works. And the Europe of space is one of the most spectacular components of this Europe that works. Europe's 50-year space odyssey continues with regular rocket launches, a vast swathe of Earth observation and probes at the edge of knowledge. Today, one of those missions at the frontier of scientific knowledge is Rosetta. And right now, the spacecraft is four million kilometers away from the comet and closing fast. Previously on Comet Hunters, the team were warming up Rosetta's instruments. Today, at ESA's base in the Netherlands, Matt Taylor and Fred Janssen are planning the science. What we're doing from a scientific point of view is now looking at the longer term to see what we're going to do once we get to the comet. This year we're also looking to identify where that lander will go down, where, where's the best point to put that lander. What is really exciting here of course is the target, we don't know it even. So everything that we prepare now, one single whim of the comet and it could be thrown out the window. I had a tattoo done of a previous mission I was working on, so of course I had to have one done of Rosetta. So here is the beast. Hi Rosetta, you've done well, you've come out of hibernation, no more sleeping, it's on like Donkey Kong, let's do some science. Next time in space we go right back to the beginning with a story about the Big Bang. See you then. <laughs>